I'm so excited to have you on the podcast. Brother Brian was on the podcast and he had such a good episode. I I know that I always say I'm like, this is one of my favorite episodes. And <laughs> it's not about like everybody's episode, but it's just because I love it so much. But yeah. Brian's was so good. And I just it was just such an impactful episode. And so when you reached out and you told me your story, I like immediately screenshotted it and sent it to Lauren, who does all the editing. And I was like, oh my gosh, like we have to have a podcast. And I mean, just the fact that, you know, my husband, Jesse is so cool yeah. because he just, I mean, he thinks the world of you. And so he was just kind of telling me a little bit about you and I'm I'm really excited to hear your story and I know that a lot of people need to hear it. So I'm excited too. So tell me um a little bit about you, maybe like what you do for work, a little bit about your family, just to give us some context before we get jumping into your story. Yeah, so I'm the oldest of five. Uh Brian is the next oldest, and then we have two more brothers, and then my my sister Lauren is the youngest. Grew up in Farmington. Kaysville area. I, they're all still up there. I'm the only one that's that's not. Um, we moved down to St. George in, so I guess, first of September last year. And then I met my now fiance about 10 months ago. And she's from Cedar City. So we're making the move up to Cedar. Um, and I just took the job as a uh, the golf coach for, the, for Cedar High School. Oh, so. my gosh. That is amazing. <laughs> Jesse is a major golfer. So yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's, it's exciting. So yeah, I, I have no idea why we moved to St. George. I think it was uh, my, my oldest son just turned 17 last week and he wants to play golf at either SUU or down in Utah tech. And so I think that was kind of part of the reason we need a change. We liked it down there for, I guess it was only about a year, not quite a year, but mm -hmm. now we're going to be in Cedar. It's awesome. So. I love it. Let's let's jump into your story. I'm super excited to hear it because you grew up in the same circle as my husband. So yeah, yep. a little bit, but I'm ex I'm excited to hear it. So let's just start from the beginning. Yep, you bet. So my story is a lot like as far as like growing up really is a lot like my brother Brian's grew up in a very LDS family. I don't think we were we weren't like, I guess you'd call like staunch LDS or like church clothes on Sunday all day and like couldn't play with your friends. I mean, we pretty liberal when it came to that stuff but i mean church every sunday being the oldest i always felt i always felt that pressure of like having to set a good example but that's not i mean that's for sure not what kept me in the church i think i remember having a testimony pretty early on but yeah pretty normal upbringing you know church ef i went to efy four times served a mission i mean from till i was 21 i mean things were pretty normal i served a faithful mission in california in the ventura mission yeah, I don't think there's anything really interesting when it comes to like the church or growing up uh, for the first like 21 years about my story. It was, it was pretty cut and dry, like die in the wool Mormon family. Pretty normal. You know, you're living the just a regular normal life. So how did that like how did things change from there? The biggest thing that changed, I think, was. Well, when, when it started, I don't think it changed for me at this point, but about seven, I think it was seven or eight months before I came home for my mission. Um, I was serving as a zone leader, and my mission president called me in. It was right before his own conference, and he's like, hey, I don't know how to tell you this, but uh, your parents' divorce was final today. And I was like, what? Out of the blue. Like, no idea. I, I remember they had, like, a bad fight, like, right before I left. But, I mean, that's the fight I remembered. It was, like, one bad fight. It wasn't, it wasn't that bad. So it was, like, out of the blue. But I was on my mission. I think he gave me like 15 minutes to call them both. And I, I'll never forget. Like I called and like chewed them out, both of them. Like, this is wrong. This is against God. Like I was, I was pissed. Like I was so mad. But then I just went about the work. I was like, I'll deal with that later. Finished the, like the eight months of my mission. And then I think that's the first thing that kind of like started a chain of events. Definitely not like the cause of what happened to me, but I got home from my mission. My two younger brothers were on drugs. My little sister was, uh, I think she was nine when I got home. My dad was nowhere to be found. My mom was super sad. Like our family was just kind of in disarray and it was too much for me. Like being the oldest, I just ran. I beelined it up to Utah State. That's where, I mean, my both my parents' families are up there and I just ran. I was like, screw this. I don't want to deal with it. 
So I just took off up there. I was still in the church, but I think that's kind of the point where I, I can't remember if I made like a conscious decision, like I'm going to do whatever I want. But I think subconsciously, that's that's kind of how it was. Like, I didn't want to deal with that heartache, what was going on at home, way too much pressure of being the oldest. And so I think subconsciously, I just started kind of doing what I want. I still for about two years, like I taught Sunday school in the singles ward. Uh, me and one of my roommates team taught Sunday school. And this is kind of similar to my brother's story. I, I was kind of living a double life where I would teach Sunday school, but then I was like partying at the frat house on the weekends, you know, and I met good friends over there. And I was kind of like one foot in the church, one foot in this party scene. And I had never partied before. Like I'd never drank, never smoked, never had sex, nothing before my mission. And slowly I just started, I started gravitating more towards like the party scene and the not church scene. I kept my good friends, but I felt, I don't know if it's like more free, but I think the party scene and the friends that I had, like a fraternity, it felt, and this is weird, but it felt safer at the time because the more I partied and the more I chose them, the less I felt about, about what was going on at home, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And so I kind of gravitated toward them and I'd go to church. Like when I went home, um, I wasn't vocal about like not going to church, still had a testimony, prayed every once in a while. I mean, I, I think, uh, it's that jelly roll song. I don't know if you've heard it. The one that says like, I only talk to God when I need a favor. That was me <laughs> for like a long time. But yeah, testimony wise, like I, I kind of, I think it was still there. I still felt the spirit. But as far as like being active, I wasn't active and it stayed that way for probably 12, 13, 14 years. And during that time, that's kind of when the most stuff happened in my life. Right when I went to Utah State, I met a girl. We got married in the temple and it was a mess. We were divorced three months later. Um, and that was kind of a more like mom and dad, I'll prove to you, this is how you do it. Like you get married in the temple. Like I was a dead set to like show my parents that they were wrong. This is how you do it. A lot of it was like, I wanted to set an example for my, my brothers who were struggling. And so that lasted three months. Um, and at that time I had moved back home to get married and everything. And then when that divorce happened, I went straight back up to Utah state, met another girl there. We partied a lot. I ended up getting her pregnant, had my, my oldest son, that ended in divorce. I'm not going to go into too much details about like the marriages because there's a lot of them, but that ended in divorce. And then I went through a period where I kind of cleaned up. I, I, I moved back home. I was living at my mom's house and I, I, I cleaned up my life. I went to the bishop. I was disfellowshipped and I was happy. I was really happy because I was coming back and I was on cloud nine for probably a good eight or nine months. And then I met my daughter's mom. She was Catholic. Um, we got married. We, we met and got married within three months of each other. Uh, this is in my late 20s. And long story short, that didn't work out either. When that divorce happened, it, it destroyed me. The other two were like, the first one was like, eh, whatever, it was three months, stupid. The second one kind of hurt because I had a son. And the third one, it, it, it destroyed me. Like I was devastated. And, you know, my brothers kind of knew my history of like partying through, through college and stuff. And at that time they had been sober for years. Like they had cleaned up their lives. They were sober. And I remember I was sitting in the car with, I think my brother, Brian, we're sitting in my mom's driveway. And, and, uh, I asked him, I'm like, do you think I have uh, like a problem with alcohol or drugs? Cause I wasn't at that point, I hadn't done like any hard drugs. I probably smoked weed in college, but, and I drank like a lot, just partying. But I wasn't like a daytime drinker. I wasn't hiding bottles. I wasn't the typical alcoholic. He's like, man, I don't know, but you definitely need some help. Like you've been through three marriages in eight years, two kids from two different moms. So you need some help. And he's like, I don't know if you're an alcoholic, but you, you know, my relationship with Renaissance Ranch, he's like, you can't come to the ranch in Bluffdale, but he's like, why don't you just get away and go to our, our sister company? And at the time it was down in Rockville. So I left and I went to Rockville. And within a couple of weeks there, it, it was hard for me because like my wife and daughter were still at home. Um, obviously I was away from my son as well. And I just, I remember thinking like, okay, 
it was a very distinct feeling. Like I, I know for a fact, like I'm not an alcoholic or an addict. I knew it because I wasn't using like they were, but we were learning the 12 steps and I started to apply a few of them. And I was like, this is working for me. Like, even though it's not alcohol or drugs, like something's wrong with me and this is working like these steps. And so I called my brother. It was like three weeks after I'd been down there and told him basically what I just told you. And he's like, yeah, I, I kind of agree. Like you probably don't have an alcohol and drug problem, but he's like, what do you think it is? And I said, I don't know. <laughs> I'm like, it's probably a lot of women. I, it might be sex. I don't know what it is, but I know I need some help. I don't, I, I, I don't want to stay here because I know it's not the right place for me, but I need to go somewhere and I need to get some help. And so he arranged for me to come back up to the aftercare program in Bluffdale at the ranch. And I started working, you know, the same 12 steps and kind of long story short, um, I started realizing that I was severely codependent. I learned that same disease of, you know, whether it's alcohol or drugs or sex or relationships, like <clears throat> those were merely just symptoms of being like really messed up in the head, <laughs> which I was. And so I kept kind of working that program. I plugged myself, plugged myself into recovery, met some really good guys who are, are still like my friends today and cleaned my life up. Then about, I don't know, it was a couple years into that. Again, cloud nine, like not back to church at this point. Um, the church was kind of out of sight, out of mind. I, I think I figured like, Hey, last time I, last time I was on cloud nine and I was doing well, they had to do the church and it didn't work. So I was like, this time I'm just going to use like the program, the 12 steps, the brotherhood, plug myself in, but I'm not going to use the church. And I got happy. So through one of the guys that I knew from recovery, his wife had a best friend. She's like, you've got to meet this girl, blah, blah, blah. So I met her and uh, we started dating. She had been sober a year. She was super happy. And things started going downhill. It was slow for me, but it was quick for her. Like she was sober for a year and then I caught her with alcohol. And then she started using Adderall. And so my relationship with her lasted for about six years. So the first year, pretty darn good. We had a, we had a daughter together. We were planning on getting married. And then she started abusing the Adderall. She started lying. I started finding... Like she had a burner phone that she said was a toy for her kids. And I found out as a drug dealer, it, it was a mess. And so for four more years, I tried to hold on to that. And, and we weren't married. I was like, nope, not doing that again. I tried to hold on as like as tight as I could. Like I'm not getting divorced again. I won't do it. I won't, I'm not getting married again. And we had another girl. So my two youngest daughters are from her. And it got so bad that I said, you know, you've got to get some help or like we've got to change. And, and I had slowly slipped back into the codependency. I won't go into like a ton of details about her, but if you knew the extent of what she was doing, you'd be like, you stayed with her for four years. <laughs> like I slipped right back into codependency. So I was working as a vice president of a, a media company in Lehigh and I had really good insurance and she couldn't get in, in to rehab. She'd already been kicked out of the ranch, like on her free, free pass and messed it up. And so I called the bishop in the neighborhood and I was like, hey, could you do a marriage today? Like, can you just do a wedding? And he's like, sure, come over at three or five or whatever it was. So we just showed up and got married so that she'd go to rehab. It was like two missionaries, me, her, her mom, and her aunt. So he marries us. She packs her bags. Very next morning goes to rehab. And in the matter of three months, she gets kicked out of four rehabs. Oh my gosh. It was horrible. And it was, it was devastating because the reason she got kicked out had to do with male patients that were there with her at the same time. And I was bringing our daughters to see her and it was a mess. About a year or two years before that happened, I was on a business trip in Atlanta and this is where the kind of the church stuff comes in. So since that time, I had kind of gone back to church and, and, you know, after my, my second marriage, church was out of sight, out of mind. So I'm on this business trip in Atlanta and a buddy from elementary school reaches out. Just a cool kid. I hadn't seen him in since like seventh grade. And he's like, hey, I'm an attorney here in Atlanta. I'd love to see you. So we go to lunch together 
And we started talking about family. He's like, he was active in the church. I think he was in the bishopric at the time. He's got a wife. He's got three or four kids doing really well. So we just started small chatting. And about an hour into our lunch, we just started chatting religion. And I kind of told him my history, like, oh, I've been inactive for 20 years or whatever it was at that time. And um, he's like, I remember him asking me, like, do you still have a testimony? I'm like, I guess so. Like, I've never doubted it. Served a good mission. I, you know, and he's like, I said, what about you? And he's like, he's like, yeah, I totally do. But he said, I'm more of a progressive Mormon. It's the first time I heard that term. And I was like, what does that mean? And he's like, he explained it to me. Like, we just have more liberal ideas. And, you know, a lot of progressive Mormons think that the church is an apostasy and that the brethren have let it there. And some think this. So it's kind of the liberal side. And I mean, he was an attorney in Atlanta and it it totally fit. It it fit as a fourth grade, like when I knew him in elementary to a T. So he starts sharing. And that's when the book came up. He's like, yeah, you got to read this book. You know, this is this Denver snuffer guy is kind of a progressive Mormon. He still reads the Book of Mormon. He's got a following. So I'm like, whatever, I'll read it. So he he brought me a copy to my hotel room later that night. And I stayed up all night reading it and till like 10 the next day. I don't think my flight was till like three or four that afternoon. I, I remember the feeling of like, this dude is not well. Like this guy is, I, I could see that right away. Like, oh, it was interesting, but I'm like, there's no way he's actually, like, met with Christ. Like, I just had all my doubts about it, you know? Like, okay, thanks for letting me read this book. It was super entertaining. But I just kept, rem- like, thinking to myself, like, how do people really think that this is real? Well, so for people who have never heard of this guy, which I did actually interview a girl on the podcast named Brooke. And so maybe go back and listen to her episode one time. But she's yeah. actually the one that told me about this. And so for people that have no idea about the Denver snuffer group, tell us like a little bit, just to give us some context here. So is he saying like he met with Christ and then give us some context? Yeah. So that book, um, the second comforter, it's conversing with the Lord through the veil, I think is what it's called. It's not a very long book, super interesting book, but he claims it's his story about he met personally with Jesus Christ, like face to face. And then the rest of the book is the steps that you need to take in this life to be able to have that same experience. Mm, and okay. I had learned, I had learned enough about like calling an election made sure the second anointing. I'm like, that's not how it works, you know? And I started questioning that. And then I started thinking about my own testimony. Like, man, I haven't been to church for 20 years. Like, where do I stand? Like kind of at a weird spot, no desire to go back zero. And keep in mind, like, this is like three and a half years into this fourth marriage that's she's shooting meth intravenously. Like, I'm worried sick about my kids being there with her. My life's a mess. Mm -hmm. But actually, the job I was doing at the time was fantastic. I loved it. I was pretty happy, dude. So anyway, back to Brett. I call him back right before I leave on the plane. Well, four or five hours. And I said, hey, I read the book. We had like a good hour, hour and a half conversation about it. He was telling me why he does believe, but I had no interest. I didn't believe it. Like I knew this guy was a crackpot and and he's a great guy. Like I've listened to a lot of interviews, very decent, good human being, but super weird, way out there. And so are his followers. And I think he'd laugh if he heard me say that. Like I've had lunch with Denver before and he gets it all the time where people are like, dude, you are crazy. Like you're a crackhead. Like your ideas are way out there. And he just laughs. Like he loves it. Super good guy. So then Brett's like, well, I have one more thing to share with you. Like, if I bring it by, will you read it on the plane? And I was like, sure. So he brought me the CES letter. Never heard of it. At this point, the CES letter was like, Jeremy had written it. And he had a PDF copy of it. It wasn't published. It, this is like a few months after Jeremy re- like wrote it. And... I was like, okay. And he kind of explained to me what it was. He's like, this guy, Jeremy, super good dude. He had questions. He wrote the CES director and he's waiting for an answer. Like he was still waiting. I'm like, sure, I'll read it. So I get on the plane and here's, here's where thing went south for me. This is like six years ago. So I start reading. It's just, it was probably like 25 pages, just eight by 11 PDF. Some of it's hard to read. It it was actually a photocopy PDF of Jeremy's handwriting. It was like his handwritten. I started reading it. At first, I was like, okay, this is the stuff I heard on my mission. It's the rock and the hat. It's blah, blah, blah. Some of it was new. Like, I never knew about some of the Book of Abraham stuff. 
So someone was like punching me in the face, punching me in the gut because I trusted Brett and Brett's a super smart dude, attorney. I'm like, he's not crazy. At first I was like, okay, giving me that book by Denver, like Brett, you might be a little weird, but I trusted him. Like, cause every time I had questions on my mission or asked my dad or asked my mission president, whatever it was about ants, it was always, and I think a lot of people relate to this. It was just brush it off. Don't worry about it. We'll find that out later in the afterlife. Just have faith. No one would ever say whether it happened or not. You know, I always thought of my mission, like, this is just crap. I'd laugh at it. But then I'm reading the CS letter in the plane and I'm like, some of this is true. Like Joseph really did put a rock in the hat besides the first 116 pages. That's the only time he used the Urim and Thummim. And then he put a rock in a hat. I'm like, whoa. And I remember having this feeling in my gut, like, oh, holy crap, some of this is true. So I'm shaken. I mean, in fact, I think I got like nauseous on the plane. Like I was shaken. And I'm like, dude, I'm on a plane going home to a mess of a wife, but, you know, like trying to stay happy at work. Now I got these questions in my head. So I get home and I remember reading that that CES letter. I mean, I went through it. I marked it. I highlighted it. I circled it. I had notes. I had my own pages. And I had all these questions that I wanted to ask my mission president. I wanted to ask my dad. And I ended up, I did ask them and I got the same questions. Like, don't worry about that stuff. That stuff will pull you away, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, I don't care. I, I want to know like why the church still to this day teaches the wrong translation of the Book of Mormon. I felt betrayed. That's the best way to say it. Like, I felt like I'd been kicked right in the gut. That set me on a six-year journey of, like, studying everything I could get my hands on. Everything. Deep doctrine, conference talks, church apologists, Mormon stories podcasts, Mormon discussions, anything I could get. And I loved church history anyway and, like, deep doctrine. I was loving this stuff. That kind of started, like, I hate the term faith crisis, but it's true. It is a crisis, but it's also beautiful in the same way. Sometimes it's happy. And I went through this six-year journey of, like, hate, betrayal. Maybe I'll go back. No, I can't. Or, okay, God, I'll go back, but just explain this. Like, just explain why the 14-year-olds that Joseph married. Just make it make sense, even if there's no answer. And then I'll go back. And I, I made so many deals with God. Like, I, I know some things don't have answers. But there's got to be an explanation. Like, God, I'll go back if they just stop asking children sexual questions in bishops' interviews. Like, all the stuff I was mad at. For about four years into that, I owned an advertising agency, and I was doing the advertising for Mormon Stories podcast and Mormon discussions. And I was deeply involved in the ex-Mormon community. Not ever in the way to, like, try to tear down the church, which, but I will be honest. Like, there was times I was so mad that I would bad mouth the heck out of the church. I hated it. I hated it. But once in a while, I would talk to God and just say, hey, please, just an explanation. Just make it make sense. I'll go back. I have the intent, like the whole Moroni 10, 3, 2, 5. Like, I'll go back. Just make it make sense a little bit. Tell me why they don't teach it the correct way. Like, t help me understand why Joseph did marry 14-year-olds. Knowing now what I do, like, God probably just laughed. Like, that's not important. <laughs> like, that's not what it's, this, is, this is about. I was starting to get bored with studying. Because for six years, it was... When I was in my car, it was a podcast or a conference talk or an apologist. Like, that consumed my life. When I was at home, that's what I read. And a lot of people would say, like, well, were you reading the Book of Mormon? I'm like, yes. Like, I was doing the whole, like, well, you can't just read that. You got to read. I was. Like... I wanted to know, like, okay, here's like a, a church history thing. What does the church say about it? What do the scriptures teach about it? I was doing both sides, and it was just not making sense, and it would make me more angry. I was done. Like, it wasn't fun anymore to study, which is why I did it. I never was trying to study and learn answers so I could go back. I didn't want to go back most of the time. I didn't. And so my daughter, Lenny, she turned eight last February. And she had asked questions about baptism here and there. You know, my mom's active, my stepdad, my brother Brian, obviously, my dad, tons of active 
family members. And I was like, yeah, you can get baptized. She finally asked me, Lenny. And I was like, yeah, I don't care. So we started talking about it. My next door neighbor is a sweet old lady in St. George. And she kept inviting us to church. And so I said, hey, Gwenna, can you get the bishop's number? Uh, Lenny wants to be baptized. And I, I probably have to meet the bishop. She gives me his number. And I text him. And I was like, hey, bishop. You know, this is Land of Heaton. I, I moved into your ward in September. I've got a daughter who turned eight last February. She wants to be baptized. And I know she probably needs to talk to you. And then for some reason I said, and, and I, if you've got time after, like, I'd like to talk to you too. No idea why I said that. Lenny and I go to meet with the bishop. And it was funny because I walked in and I saw him say, I'm like, Chad Evans? He's like, you know me? And I'm like, it turns out that he played basketball for Utah State all four years I was there. And he was like one of their stars. I love this guy. And I'm like, are you my bishop? And he's like, are you Landon Heaton? I'm like, yeah. And I'm like, no way. So we sat there and reminisced forever, hit it off. He's my exact age. So we go in. Lenny has her little interview where I'm sitting there. And then I had her bring her iPad so she could sit outside the bishop's office. I, I didn't want her in there because like, I didn't know what was about to happen. I didn't know if I was about to have my name like removed, yell. I don't know. I just knew I was done studying. My my mom had said like, whatever you do, just like don't have your name removed because that'll break my heart. So I don't think I would have done that. But there was times I was so mad that I almost did. So Lenny's just like sitting out. We kind of left the door open. And I start talking to Bishop Evans, telling him the same story. I don't know if it was him as much as it was like just the right time, I don't know. But I know when I left that meeting, I was both feet in. He had texted me a talk by, uh, I think it's Michael E. Wilcox. Michael Wilcox. It's on prayer. For anyone out there that like wants a killer talk on prayer, he talks about how the God we worship is he calls it a fourth watch God. And he compares it to like when the apostles used to go out and fish, there was three watches during the night. Some of the guys would sleep and one would take watch, right? And so the night that Christ, you know, before the morning that he walked on water, you know, it was storming and it was dangerous. And like every single watch, they prayed like, save us, save us, save us. Like they had questions and he didn't. He saved them in the fourth watch, which there's no such thing back then there's only three watches and then it's morning time and that made sense to me because i've been praying for like years six years like make it make sense i'll go back if it's true just please let me know and i had the intent like Marone, i said like i'll go back just but it was what i wanted just do what i want and i'll go back <laughs> you know and looking back it's silly but it wasn't at the time like i was serious and he also says in that talk he talks about he talks about how god and life prepare spots in our heart until we're ready to receive something. I think that's what really hit me. And Bishop Evans had shared that talk with me in the in the meeting, and then he sent me the, uh, the actual talk after. But that made sense. For some reason, maybe it was that spot in my heart was finally like big enough or ready. I, you know, I, I thought a lot about this since these last three months, because it's crazy, but Maybe the six years that I was studying and like hating the church and bad mouthing the church and advertising against the church, may maybe Heavenly Father knew I had to do that. I don't know. But somehow, like that experience and life and Heavenly Father, when I walked out of there, like the spot was ready. I remember I walked out of that, that room and uh, like I'm a pretty emotional dude. It, obviously I was crying and my daughter's like, daddy, what's wrong? Like, what did you guys talk about? And I'm like, Oh, I wish you could understand what Lenny, like, this is crazy. And the, the, the funny thing was like, I had met my now fiance about eight months prior and she knew how I felt about the church. She, her whole family is active and she's not. And she had a lot of hard feelings toward the church. And crazy thing was is i had i had to call her i was like carly uh <laughs> this is gonna be a hard conversation but i'm not gonna drink anymore <laughs> i'm not gonna vape anymore we gotta stop having sex like out of the blue 
And you can imagine how she felt like, what the, like, what? <laughs> what? <laughs> and this is like, I'll call you in a half hour after Lenny's thing's done, right? And yeah, whatever, pick up whiskey on the way home. I don't know. And then all of a sudden, so she was like, what the heck just happened? I mean, she's been incredible since then. And uh, the next time I met with my bishop, I remember he said, he said, it's obvious that, that your heart's been changed. It's, he, calls, he called it a miracle. Like, it's a miracle uh, what happened. And then he's like, he's like, well, do you want to baptize Lenny? And I was like, what? I didn't think I even had that chance. I mean, I thought for sure, like, I had been, I had been disfellowshipped 12 years before. And then, like, like I'm for sure going to be excommunicated. And I was ready for it. So long story short, I mean, a week ago Saturday, I was able to baptize her and my stepdaughter soon to be stepdaughter oh that just gave me the chills all over <laughs> yeah <laughs> pretty cool stuff yeah it's been it's been uh i still don't have a handle myself obviously it's been crazy for three months i still don't know i still don't know why stuff has happened the way it's happened the feeling i had when i walked out of that meeting with my bishop it wasn't just like ah maybe i'll go back like man, yeah like i haven't felt the spirit in a while like yeah no, it was like I was both feet in, going to Desert Book to like buy garments, whatever he wanted me to do. Like I was in. It all came flooding back. Yeah, I was able to baptize them. Obviously, back in full fellowship, like wearing garments again, paying tithing. 12 weeks. Wow. Yeah, it's been absolutely insane. I'm still trying to put it all together as to like, you know, like I said, like why things had to happen like they did and why I had to go through what I did in the last six years. To me, it seems easy. Like I've, I've had conversations during prayer. You could have just done this six years ago. You could have done it three years ago or five years ago, wh whatever. Like all those times I said, like, just help me help it make sense. You could have given me the same feeling and I would have done it. But then I think to myself, like, would I have done it maybe for a month or two or like maybe he knew for like seven or eight months? Yeah, I just try to have faith. Like, I probably wouldn't have done it. Plus, like Bishop Evans, he the things he said in that meeting, it wasn't just sharing that talk with me, but he didn't he didn't answer my questions either. But he was honest. And I talked to him too, like what what was said in that meeting? Like, what did we talk about really besides like the prayer talk and stuff? He's like, I can't really remember either. He said, I just remember the feeling, you know, and the spirit that was there. It, it was incredible. But the coolest thing is like everything that I had learned on my mission and more, just everything came flooding back. Oh. Scriptures I used to know that were memorized. And I was reading scriptures the last six years. You know what I mean? Like I was studying everything, good and bad. It just all came flooding back. It's been a pretty crazy three months, to say the least. That is seriously... So amazing. So how did your all of your ex-Mormon crew, how did they all respond to your coming back? So I have some that, um, you know, really close friends. I changed my like profile picture on Facebook and my background to like me and, and my daughters. Yeah. I didn't go far as far to put me in whites, but it was like me and my suit and them and their baptism of whites. And some of them thought it was a joke. Um, I've got a mission companion that it was my favorite. I trained him. Uh, a Samoan kid. He's incredible. And him and I have had a lot of good talks because he, about four years into my faith crisis, he called me and he's like, man, this is all a bunch of crap. I'm like, yep, I didn't want to tell you. But so we had been talking and then I haven't had a chance to talk to him yet, but I sit here right now wondering, like, I wonder what Elder's thinking right now. Like, he's probably like, what the heck is going on? And I've had some pretty, like, pretty nasty snide comments from, from people on social media. And I don't post a lot, big events. As soon as that happened, it was the next day that I, I texted the guys from Mormon discussions. And I just said, Hey, this is kind of a conflict of interest. Like, I don't want to get into like what's happened in my life, but I, I, I can't, I'm going back to church and I, I can't advertise for you anymore. And he was super cool about it. And I, I hope I can still remain friends with him. He's, his name's Bill real. He's an, he's a stud. He's an incredible man. He's helped me a ton. I don't know what he thinks. I haven't talked. I mean, it's only been three three months. I hope that I can talk to some of these guys and just all I want to do now is tell my story. There's so many people, and I and I noticed this. There's obviously so many people that come back. You know that. Mm -hmm. You have a podcast about it. I've listened to a lot of your episodes, but 
there, there's maybe some that I don't know, but it seems like when people get deep into church history, like there's no coming back. And I always thought to myself, like, there's no way. I hope to be someone in the church now that that can tell those people, like, hey, there there is a way. Mm-hmm. I can't tell you what it is, <laughs> but mm-hmm. I can tell you that in my life there was a miracle. Because I still don't know how the heck I'm sitting here. I have no, I mean, I'm sitting here like wearing garments mm-hmm. and just baptized my daughter. Three and a half months ago, I was huge anti-Mormon. Huge. Mm-hmm like advertising against the church. I don't know. Yeah. It wasn't a prayer. I didn't nail down and say like, is the book of Mormon true? I didn't do any of that stuff. Not that that's bad, but like for me, it was a six year process and getting, well, I guess it was a 20 plus year process getting married four times and going through what I did and like studying my butt off, yeah. whatever it took. So if you had to give some advice to somebody that is just, deep into, you know, deep into all the anti stuff online. And they're just like, they feel, you know, they feel bamboozled or they feel like lied to or whatever. And, um, what advice would you give to somebody like that? That's in that situation. That's a good question. First of all, there is a way back, but I don't think that should be the focus. I've had discussions with my Bishop since he, he calls all of that stuff fluff all of the stuff about Joseph Smith and church, he calls it all fluff, meaning what's really important in the gospel, like that stuff doesn't matter. And I, I've heard that before. It didn't make sense until that day when I was finally ready to hear it, but I'd heard that before. I'm like, no, it does. It does matter. And I think there's a lot of people that are in that spot right now. That's like, how could the church be true? If A, B, C, D, nobody can deny that. And I know, the general authorities, the apostles, brought, it's not their job to say that. And a lot of people like want them to say that. It's not their job. But I think it's okay to say that. And to add on to that, it's okay that that stuff happened. One of the examples that I've thought since in the last three months, and I don't know why this didn't hit, this probably would have helped me like the last six years. But I think to myself, I've gone through four marriages, tons of horrible stuff. And I don't mind putting that out there. Like, I'm an honest person. I have nothing to hide. Like, I've been rotten at points in my life. Mm-hmm. What if God came down to me right now and said, hey, Landon, I've got a job for you to do. Maybe it's not as big as like restoring the gospel or restoring the priesthood. Maybe it's just something little, right? Then I look at myself and I say, okay, in 150 years from now, if people were looking back on my life and then saying like, yeah, God called that dude to do A, B, C, and D, they would say, bull crap. There's no way. There's no way he, no way. Look what he did. Look how he lied. Look how he deceived. Look at that, what he did. Look how he cheated on this and cheated on that, cheated on her. And like, it's the same exact thing. I have to tell you, I think about that all the time because I get messages from people literally every day and they're like, oh my gosh, podcast, it helped me out of my faith crisis or this podcast has changed my life. And I'm thinking to myself, I was a heroin addict. I was a liar and a thief and in jail. And I did everything bad under the sun. And if anybody like saw me back then, and to think that even this person who did all this bad stuff, and here I am like 10 years later, if somebody were to put a microscope on my past and be like, seeing all these things that I did, but yet God is still using me as a, you know, as just a vessel to get these messages out to people. And it's so life-changing for them. It's like hundred percent, hundred percent use imperfect people to accomplish his work. Like, right. And you could have people like down the road that would look at you and find out about your life and your history and discount the heck of what you're doing right now. Yep. Like there's no way she could be making a difference. Look at how she was. And it's, mm-hmm. it's true. You're absolutely right. Like, so what I would say, like a long answer to your question is if somebody's in that spot where they're like, I am not okay with this. That's okay. If you're not okay with Joseph marrying 14 year olds, that's okay. It's fluff. That doesn't matter. That doesn't mean that God still didn't use him as an instrument to do good stuff. The other side of it is he didn't just do bad stuff. God can still use that person to bring about the work. Stop trying to 
answer the question of like, how could this be true if Joseph did this? How could it not? Mm-hmm. It doesn't matter. To me, it seems pretentious for me to sit there and like try to judge the truthfulness of something that like, <laughs> let's be honest, we, none of us can know until we die, but we can believe with all of our hearts, right? It's not worth trying to find out what actually did and didn't happen and is it right and is it wrong? Can it be true if this happened? Like, it's exhausting. Believe me, the last six years, like, it's not worth it. Mm. And I'm not saying just ignore it. It's just the church's history. Like, that's all it is. And it's okay. I mean, it's online on, like, they're yeah. just the papers and, you know, they, they're owning the history, uh, you know, as of late, they own it. It's there. I mean, I've been having a lot of thoughts lately of why wouldn't I want an apostle to use the atonement like I do? Why wouldn't I want him to? I want them to make mistakes. You know, I like they need they not that I want to, but like they need to utilize the atonement the same way that you and I do. It's Mm -hmm. okay. And Mm -hmm. there's all this finger pointing at Joseph and Elder Holland and it doesn't matter. Like the finger pointing doesn't matter. You know, and honestly, like, unless you see Christ or whatever, like, you can't really know for a surety here unless you have something like that. All you can do is have faith. So really what it comes down to is, like, who are you or who am I to say that these things couldn't happen or God wouldn't do these things because this person was like this? It's so silly to me. That's easy for me to say now because I've had the experience. But that's the advice I would give someone is, like, it's okay. It's okay to doubt it's okay to hate. It's okay to be pissed. It's okay to curse God if you want to. Like, be as mad as you want. Figure it out. It's okay. But realize that, like, God uses very, very, very imperfect people to do very, very good things. Mm. And that's also okay. Mm. That is, that's beautiful. <laughs> I love that. That's the way I look at it. <laughs> so... Over the six years that you were going through all of that, was there ever, this is one thing that I really notice in doing this is by their fruits, you will know them. I'm imagining as you're telling your story, like I'm imagining you in that Bishop's office and it's like, I'm sure you go in there and there's a feeling of just, I don't know, like I'm, I'm just imagining it. And in my own life, it's like, the fruits of the gospel, like when I am active in the church and I am doing these things and like the fruits of that are so good. And then like before when I was, you know, out and I was on heroin and all the things like the fruits were so bad, you know, sure. and it's like the light that you have, like, I just imagine you going in and you seeing that your bishop and you know him and it's like, I just imagine that being like you recognizing good fruit and absolutely it's so true. And, and I, I remember hearing that, like, and that was a lot of times like on those, uh, like Mormon stories podcasts, like a lot of faithful people that would go on and there wasn't a ton of them, but they would always say that just look at the fruits, blah, blah, blah. And it never made sense to me until now. Like it's true. The other thing I've thought about a lot in the last three months is what, what is it going to hurt? So if you're someone that's kind of on the outside right now, like having problems with church history and stuff like that, like what's it going to hurt to be in the church? Be a good person. Like what's it going to hurt to go to church? Don't go to church. It doesn't matter. Just be a good person. You know what I mean? Like it's not going to hurt anything to go do good things, to be in the church. And it feels so good to be back. It really, really does. And I'm sure there's other churches that feel so good to be there too. And that's okay. Mm -hmm. I think that's the biggest message I have is it's okay. Whether you're in, whether you're out, whether you hate, whether you doubt, like it's okay. Mm -hmm. Stop focusing on like if A equals B and B equals C, that like that kind of crap, you you can't focus on that because it leads nowhere. Believe me, like I went Mm -hmm. as far deep into that as you can trying to find answers it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. You'll never get anywhere. (laughs) Mm -hmm. What's the biggest thing that like you've noticed since you decided to come back, like in your own life, just your, like, what's the biggest thing you've noticed about yourself or just your experience? That's probably Ashley. That's probably the biggest 
I mean, if if there was something that said like, hey, three months ago, what happened is real and you did the right thing, that's probably the biggest thing that I've noticed. Having that constant companionship again. And that might sound corny to some people, especially if they're outside of the church. I know five months ago, if I heard that, I've been like, that is so cheesy and so lame, but it's true because I feel it again. Uh, I'm more patient, especially with my kids. I wasn't impatient before, but now I'm like, I've done and said things in the last three months that I have no idea where they're coming from. I have no idea where that feeling came from. I have no idea. Feelings will come up that I remember from like on my mission or earlier, like such good feelings of the spirit. I think that's the biggest thing is that constant companionship again, that peace. So many people talk about peace. And during those last six years, I mean, when I made the decision to leave the church, I'm like, I want to find peace. And I never doubted that. Like it felt so peaceful when I was in church or on my mission. And I would always try to justify that. Like, well, that's just because I was doing like, what my family did. Well, but no, like there is an obvious piece. Is there another Christian churches? hundred million percent. There is, and that's okay. But that's what I've missed. I'm a totally different person spiritually than I was 12 weeks ago, for sure. Wow. That's so beautiful. <laughs> you are awesome. We, uh, Lauren and I, we've... Definitely had some encounters with ex Mormon people coming for us <laughs> on, on doing what we're doing. And I feel like that is one thing that I've noticed is that I mean, I don't I don't want to invalidate anybody's experience. And so people that have been, you know, wronged and you know, I don't want to say like you shouldn't feel the way you feel. Like I don't I'm not trying to invalidate anyone's experience, but one thing that I've noticed is the ex-Mormon community is very focused on like hating something and like very focused on just having disdain for one thing. And like, like I, I understand that like everyone's on their faith journey and, but it seems like it doesn't seem to bring good fruit in my, yeah, or trying to prove something wrong or prove yeah. like, right. They're, tr- they're mm-hmm. always, I agree with you, always trying to prove something or like, that's totally true. And I always, I remember like, I'd always look at people that were in the church and active, my family members, anybody, Jesse, you, Jerry, I'm Jesse's older brother. How do these people honestly believe? Like, how do they not see this? You know, that's, I mean, for six years, that was my feeling is like, how do they not see it? It's so blatantly obvious, you know? And now that I'm back and, and that's so silly, like, because it's fluff, it doesn't matter. The feelings in the church, the spirit, the fruits, like you said, that's what matters. None of that matters. I don't care if that stuff is true. Like it honestly is all fluff. Whether so-and-so did this or Joseph did that, it doesn't matter. It just doesn't matter. That's why they don't care. Like, yeah, they see it and they don't care, (laughs) you know? It's interesting because doing the podcast, it's like I've heard a lot of things that I didn't know before. And um, I mean, clearly I know things that are like blacks in the priesthood and polygamy, you know, all the things like, obviously I was aware, but there's things that like I hear for the first time, but it's like, yeah, at this point, it's like, I've seen such a drastic transformation in my own life that I can only attribute to coming back to church and the savior's atoning sacrifice working in my life. I mean, when you mentioned like I quit vaping that was one of the things that I saw so clearly in my life was like, you know, cause when you're on drugs, it's like, it's destroying your life. So you either, you have to make the choice. Am I going to quit using drugs or am I going to die? You know, like it's, yeah. you can't keep living a normal life, but with smoking or like back in my day, 10 years ago, it was smoking, but like today it's vaping when you're doing that every day and it's not killing you instantly. It's not like ruining your life today it's really hard to quit. It's sure. part of your everyday routine. And that was one of the things that I really noticed. The enabling power of the Savior's atonement working in my life was when I quit smoking after I'd been smoking for years because I wanted to get my limited use Tupperware recommend. And I was like, yeah. how am I going to do this? Like, how am I going to quit drinking coffee and smoking? I literally do this every single day. It's part of my life. It's part of my routine. How am I going to quit this? But 
I just quit. After all these years, I just stopped doing it. It was such a true miracle to be able to yeah. quit that. And like, so for you to just tell your fiance, I'm quitting vaping, I'm quitting drinking, we're not having sex anymore. Like, and then to baptize your daughter and your stepdaughter, that is the Savior's enabling power of his atonement working in your life to be 100%. able to just pluck those things out. Yep. And the coolest thing too is my fiance has been so, I mean, I was scared at first because I knew how she kind of felt about the church. She didn't hate it. She didn't like, she didn't, wasn't on the same journey as me, like anti by choice, not active for a long time. And she's been super, super supportive. You know, I've, I've caught her on her knees a few times praying. It's amazing. My, uh, my 12 year old daughter got baptized like a year ago. My brother, Brian baptized her. I, w I wasn't there. I was living in Denver at the time. And then you know, he baptized his wife and then he baptized my little girl. And then her mom, my ex-wife got baptized. You know, I, I've, I've talked to my son who's, you know, he just turned 17 last week and I've had conversations with him about like, I will support you a hundred percent if you go on a mission, but it's a freaking waste of time. I've told him that a million times, but I, I mean, seriously, I'll support you. And so now he sees me, he's like, whoa. And he's seen the change in me. And, <laughs> you know, like, now my daughter will send scriptures to me like, dad, I read this scripture. And I'm like, man, that for one, it's sad that like, she felt like she couldn't do that before, but it's so cool that she does it now. You know? So my point is like, it's touching other people's lives. My fiance, my daughter, my son, my, both of my daughters have asked me for, uh, they call it a daddy's blessing. The dude four months ago was not giving daddy's blessing. It's like, I wasn't, I was probably making fun of it. So it's just, it's been such an incredible transformation, such an incredible change. I still don't understand most of it, but I love every second of it, you know? Mm -hmm. I love that. That is so beautiful. Um, okay. Right as we're wrapping up here, I just want to hear what is one final thing that you want to leave people with as they're listening to this episode, they're listening to your story. What is one final thing that you want people to know? Well, the first thing would be, like I've said before, like, it's okay. Like, wherever you're at in your journey, it's okay. The other thing I think, and maybe this sounds cheesy or corny, but for those who have been active in the church and know how it feels that are not active anymore, you're missing out. That doesn't mean, like, if, if where you are in your journey now, if it takes you four more years to get there, like, don't just do it now if it's not your time. But you're missing out reach out to somebody. I love what you do. Reach out to somebody who's been on this podcast, somebody who knows a bishop and just, I wish I just would have gone back to somebody. And I, and I had plenty of chances with general authorities. I talked to my mission president just to say like, just help me figure it out. Right. I, it was always tell me this or tell me why this or tell me the answer to this. I wish I just would have been humble enough to say, just help me figure this out. Not whether the church was true, just life. Like, just take my hand and help me figure it out. And that's one thing that I would leave with, with people that are, because I know how it feels. It's so heavy. It's sad. You feel like you've lost a part of yourself. So one, it's okay. Two, reach out to somebody. And then three, be truly humble enough to be okay with wherever it goes. If it goes down like a, a Christian church path, cool, go down it. But be humble enough to just go where that path takes you. But you've got you've got to reach out to someone and just say, hey, help me along this path. Because I was so alone a lot of times during those six years. I didn't want to talk to my family because I didn't want them to know what I knew. I was scared they'd leave the church. And I was alone. I really had nowhere to go. And that it, it all goes back to it's okay. Wherever you're at, it's okay that you hate, that you're pissed, that you're angry. It's totally okay. Don't mm -hmm. be afraid of it. I love that. And I love that you brought up like, hey, if it, your path is to a Christian church, that's okay. I, um, I have to comment on this. I started my path back at the Salvation Army rehab, and it was a Christian-based church. And we did Bible study, and that was when I started to have that, oh my gosh, this feels good. Like, this this yeah. feels good. And I was in the praise band and singing the, the praise band songs, yeah. and, and I was like, this feels good. 
So I like that you're just, you know, you said that it's okay where you're at and it's okay yeah. to work through that. Yeah. It's it, the last thing I would say is I try not to focus so much on what is black. I, I'm, I'm less black and white now when it comes to the savior and God and Christianity and Mormonism in my belief, like the way I look at it, stop focusing so much on what's right and wrong. Like, is it true or is it not? And I think a lot of people in the church do that. Like, it's either true or it's not. Maybe, but who cares? Like, stop worrying about the black and the white and just be a good person and just do what feels peaceful and right. The anti-Mormon podcasts, some of the Mormon apologist podcasts, the same thing. There's such a focus on proving so-and-so wrong, proving that so-and-so lied, proving that Joseph did this. Who cares? Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter. Like, stop focusing on the black and white and just live a life that's peaceful. Mm -hmm. Because like you said before, like in that spot, like the feeling is just empty. It's sad. I was left longing for something. I don't like that. Mm -hmm. I, I, I had to let that go. So just don't focus on what's wrong or right. Just be a good person. I love that. Go where it feels peaceful. I love yeah. that so much. So good. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. I am just so happy to hear your journey and just so happy. So thanks thank for having me. Yes. <laughs> you, I want to let you know too, like the, I've, I've listened to probably 25 episodes in the last three months. Um, I wish I would have found your podcast before. Well, I, actually, I don't know. Cause I might've like totally torn it down. So I don't know, but the last three months, this podcast has helped me tremendously. When I was out of the church, it felt so good to have people that understood me. And now mm -hmm. that I'm back in, it feels so good to have people that understood me. And yeah, all of it. thank There's... you for what you do. It's so, it's so needed. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for being a supporter of the Comeback Podcast and listening to our episodes. It would mean so much to us if you would like and subscribe to our YouTube channel. It helps other people be able to find us and we want to share this message to everyone.